Welcome to Possibilities. You are in for such a treat. Oh my gosh. A couple of months ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing Wes Hall. Wes is one of the dragons the investors on the hit show Dragon's Den. And he wrote this book, this book that had me in tears, my heart pounding on the edge of my seat. And I had lots of questions for him. So I was thrilled that he agreed to be part of our live event. And we talked about his life and his dreams, what he has been through and what he is creating in the future. Enjoy. It was a gentleman passing by on a bicycle who heard us crying and looked in to make sure everything was okay. My mother's little shack only had one room, so he barely had to cross the threshold to realize it wasn't okay. There were three of us inside, me, my sister Joan, and my brother Ian. Joan was the oldest but still just four. I was 18 months. Ian was a baby. I'm not sure how long we had been on our own. Our mother had gone while we were sleeping. Even as young as we were, we may have put together that she wasn't coming back. It was thoughtless and cruel of her to abandon us. But when I look back, I see it as the greatest gift my mother ever gave me because it led to a childhood spent with my maternal grandmother, Julia Vassell. Can you tell us about growing up with your grandmother, Wes? Yeah, Julia Vassell, she was, uh, she was absolutely amazing, you know? And I can, I have a, a picture of her and me and, uh, and me and her in the tin shack on my desk on Bay Street. And uh, she was just, just this awesome person, you know. When you think about that, uh, and for those who read the book, you would realize that this man on the bicycle went to the plantation where my grandmother was working. So the, I, I believe it was on the banana plantation that she was working that day because in Winchester, which is the, the town that my, my mother lived in and she abandoned us in, uh, the banana plantation was in that town not too far away. And uh, so uh, he went to the plantation to get her, and she came back with my older sister, Barbara. And uh, she came back with a trolley. And she came in and she packed us up, put uh, me and Ian on the trolley. And then he, um, he took, she took us uh, to the plantation shack that she was living in. And it was a two bedroom shack that, uh, that she had. And with me, Ian, and Joan, she now has 10 grandkids in that plantation shack that she was uh, raising on a plantation worker's salary. And, uh, you know, we hear people talk about this tin shack and people may roll their eyes and go, you know, it's, it's exaggerated, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's very real. And, uh, and when you live in it, and there's pictures that we probably didn't have here, that actually showed uh, the shack, and I can really, if uh, once we pull it up, can really describe it because that is the picture that I have on my on my desk at work. And uh, there was a story when um, this this um, I know I may be off track, so uh, Hannah, you can bring me back. So this was um, I made the cover. I was the first black person to make the cover of the Report and Business magazine. And um, there was an article that was being written about the CP Rail proxy contest. It was a big fight in Canada. Bill Ackman from the US uh, came in and essentially threw out the board and the CEO of CP Rail. And so they were, they were doing this story, the Globe and Mail was doing this story on this uh, big fight. And everybody they talked to said, have you spoken to Wes? And they go, no, I, I didn't speak to Wes. They said, well, you need to speak to Wes. They talked to the investment bankers, the lawyers, everybody. And then he said, you know, I better talk to this guy, Wes. So he called up my office and said, we're writing an article and we just want to have like a little thing. We want to just talk to this guy, Wes, that people keep, keep talking about. And he came into my office and he walked in 
and my office is there's glass in the front. And as he was walking uh, to my office, and he got to my office, he, you can tell they paused when he saw me. He paused. And then he went in, shook my hand, and sat down. And the first thing he saw, it was just how my office was. And he started to walk around my office while he was talking to me, and he was fixated on this picture. And he's like, um, tell me about that picture. And I started telling him about the picture. And he goes, wow. First of all, when I came here, I was very surprised that you're black. I didn't expect to see a black man in this office. Nor did I expect all these people to be saying all these incredible things about a black person. And then I realized that you're from there. And then I got a lot of hate mail on Bay Street because all of a sudden I became the cover and the feature of the article. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine when the article dropped, everybody was looking forward to it, right? Because it's a big deal. And everybody was looking forward to it. And they saw my picture on the cover and started to read about me, right? And, uh, and, and, and it just shows how when you embrace your identity, mm. your true identity, how great things may happen. Some bad things may happen too. But if you embrace your identity, uh, good things may happen. But this picture, the reason why I kept it there, a number of reasons, but one of the reasons why I kept it there is because I would have been dishonoring mama had I not embraced this history. Could you imagine that she came and she worked so hard, brought us in? She was 60 years old, by the way, when she got us in from that plantation house that my mother abandoned us. Think about you being 60, getting ready to retire, have a little bit of nest egg in the bank, and then you have all these grandkids that you now have to look after, and you know you're going to do it for the rest of your life because nobody else is going to come to rescue them and help them and you're not resentful. So for me, how could I be resentful when I go through hard times in life? Like, how could I be upset? Growing up with Mama, that's what he called his grandmother, Mama, was the happiest time. It was, you loved it. You loved being with her. What was she like? She was serious, man. She was <laughs> like... <laughs> she didn't play. Mama like, didn't play. You know, listen, you, you've... She didn't mess around, okay? <laughs> this, this lady did not mess around with nobody. And uh, just think about it, right? In, in the 60s in Jamaica, it's a male-dominated society. And, uh, and she was the one who was, she was working on a plantation with my grandfather. My grandfather was an alcoholic, became an alcoholic. And in the 60s, she goes, dude, you're out of here. You're out of here. And she kicked him out. And then she goes, OK, I'm going to look after my grandkids on my own, and I don't need you. So I remember when I was young, my grandfather used to, and he was an amazing guy. He just had this problem. He was never abusive. We loved him to death. But he just couldn't stay off, you know, off uh, alcohol. And so my grandmother would always give him the gears when he shows up drunk always give him the gears and then she goes in the kitchen, make him food, put it out there and he eats it outside. Okay? He's, he's, you gotta eat it outside. Because she doesn't want to think, get him confused. Thinking that there's an opportunity here for you to get back in. <laughs> gotta eat it out there. Like a dog. <laughs> okay? And then when the plate is done, one of the kids will get it and we'll wash it up for you. But then he would actually come in at nighttime and he would go into our part of the shack in our room and would sleep in our bed. And as you, you know, in the book it talks about my first experience with death was my grandfather, um, he was caught in the rain, um, left outside, came to sleep with us at night and he died in his sleep. And I remember having to crawl over him uh, to, uh, to, to get out of bed um, and uh, that, that was my first experience with him. And my grandmother, you know, she was so heartbroken by his death. And she was kneading flour when they brought the casket. I remember them bringing the casket to the house. And she was kneading the flour, and she looked at him in the casket. And she's like, I knew this was going to happen. She said some other choice words about it. But uh, <laughs> she, she essentially said, I knew this was going to happen. 
and she went back to need her flower. You know, but uh, that's the strength that that woman had. Like, and it's like, and even though she kind of disciplined us as a child, and my brothers were, you know, rambunctious, my sisters were rambunctious, it was never abusive. It was just always go, don't mess with mama because she has to go to sleep so she can go to work in the morning. And when she tells us to do something, there's no dilly-dallying around. We had to get it done. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Wes talks in the book about growing up poor. But here's how poor he was. He was so poor that the other poor kids made fun of him. Yes. Like, that, like that's at a whole different level. He says, so, so they would like give him the gears at school, right? And so Wes says on page 24, pretending I wasn't poor seemed far more ridiculous to me than just accepting that I was. So I accepted it. I grew a thick skin. When kids mocked me, I made it clear that what they thought was worthy of ridicule was no big deal. You're laughing because I'm too poor to afford shoes? Go ahead, it doesn't bother me. I moved on and it didn't take long for them to do the same. But this was your grandmother's example. Yeah, like if you look at this picture, uh, if we go back to the other picture, uh, Denise, um, those kids on that step, for example, those were great grandkids that my mother, my grandmother was still raising, by the way. Okay, she never stopped looking after other people's responsibilities. So those kids that are sitting there in that same tin shack that I grew up in, they're now being raised in that tin shack. But we talk about no, no shoes, those kids aren't wearing shoes either. Okay, this is generations of poverty that you're looking at right there. Generations and their kids are in that same situation as well. And so I remember because those, that house is built on five foot stilts because in that area it would flood all the time when, it, when they get heavy rain. And, and that's why they built the house that high. And I remember being a child about four or five years old sitting on that step that that boy standing on with my feet dangling in the water without a care in the world and my grandmother was just freaking out inside. And I remember sitting on that step because I have a permanent reminder of that tin shack. If anybody don't believe it existed, there's something, I got a reminder that I carry around with me every day. This here scar, I fell off that step and hit a rock. And I spent three weeks in the hospital and this caused that scar on it. So because I wore no shoes when I was growing up, I figured now I got to up my shoe game. Okay, that's why I got this, that's why, that's why they, you know, I, you know, I went from barefoot to red bottoms and that's, uh, you got to do something. That's the way to do it. So 18 months, you're living with your grandmother. And in her home, you felt love. You knew what it was like to be loved. But then at 11, your mother comes for you. And she doesn't want any of the other children. She only wants Wes. So just imagine for Wes how that felt to know that his mother came for him. What was that like when your mother came for you? I actually remember the day like it was yesterday because everyone was making a commotion about, you know, in, in Jamaica. And because it, where we were from in Jamaica, by the way, you should know that that part of Jamaica is the poorest part of Jamaica. It's most impoverished. And the people in that area, they're neglected because they believe, they call it in Jamaica, obya, <laughs> or voodoo. They would spend their last dollar on voodoo. They're uneducated, and that all they do is just work on a plantation and that's their life. That's the neighborhood, that's the area. That's, so when I tell people even to this day that I'm from St. Thomas, they go, yeah, yeah, you're, you're lying, right? And so everybody would say, take the gal, take the girl, them, don't, you know, all this thing in Jamaican, cursing my grandma, my mother. And she said, nope, I'm taking Wes. And I felt proud, you know, I'm like, man, I go to live with my mother. See, my mother was kind of like the celebrity in the neighborhood. She's the only one to have ever left that area. So she was very ambitious. And then she would come back and she would all dressed up very nicely. And everybody would like, wow, 
the dirt of this barracks, because that's what we call the place we lived in, or everybody called it that, it couldn't stay on her. She was just like always made up in fancy dresses, and she would just come and see us. And I get to go with her. Nobody else did. And so I thought I won the lottery until I realized I didn't. Because what was the reality of living with your mother, Wes? You know, my, it's almost like immediately when I went into, uh, she took us to a town called Maypen. And, uh, and immediately when I went into that house at 11, it was almost like you can tell that this is a, there's going to be a problem here. I met my sister, uh, my stepsister, Hillary, my uh, stepbrother, Carlton, and she had two young kids, uh, Michael and Natalie, and they were babies, essentially. And, uh, and it, was, it was clear to me, and she was married, but it was clear to me that they had nothing. They had no money. It was all a show when she get dressed up to come back to the barracks. She was just showing off on how successful she was in the city. And when I got there, I realized that she wasn't. And it wasn't long after that I realized that, first of all, her, her husband would beat her practically every single day. And we're talking about, you know, not just, we just it was really bad. Like, you know, she would be in a room screaming, and I was out there as a child, couldn't do anything about it. And then when he finished, he would either go after me or Hillary. They, they were the two that they, they did the most. And, uh, and then my mom would go to me and Hillary again. And, uh, and, so, and that happened like every day. Like there's, I remember coming home from school, I knew I was gonna get a beat in, I just didn't know why. I didn't know what the purpose was. I tried to figure out, okay, what can I do differently? Can I smile when she comes home? Uh, but it didn't really matter what happened, I would get it, you know? And, um, and I remember when I was, um, I don't know what, what happened, but my, my mother grabbed me in the face and, and there was a concrete wall and she threw, threw me in the wall and there's a crack here in the back of my, you can see it back here, uh, that, that, that left. And, uh, but she, and, and I, was, I was out, I was cold, out cold on the floor, bleeding everywhere. And there was a doctor's clinic across the street. And she went and she brought me to the nurse. And the nurse said, listen, we can't show the doctor this because you're going to go to jail. And they patched me up and then they sent me back home. And, uh, and the wound got infected. It was infected for like a year. And, uh, and, and they tried their best to, to kind of do something because they couldn't go to a hospital. They couldn't go to the doctor. So they, the nurse was trying her best to deal with it. And then my sister Hillary, she did the same thing to her. But this time, she threw a rock and knocked her out. And then Hillary, she had to go to a different clinic now in a different this, uh, you know, area because she couldn't now go to the same clinic because they're going to go, OK, we can't hide this either. right? So that's the kind of thing that I had to go through every single day of my life. Um, and it was, uh, it, was, it was something, it was a different lifestyle. Every single day, every day, she was relentless. And I mean, imagine how bad it must have gotten for Wes's stepfather to take Wes to the police station to report what happened with his mother. Like, that's how bad it got. When an alcoholic, a, 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 a woman beat an alcoholic, say, okay, you need to go report this to you. To the, to the. But again, it's, it's really a part of, for him, he felt justified in the way that he was treating my mother. But what he didn't realize was that what he was doing was now affecting me. Yeah. Because now she need an outlet. Yes. And she's looking at the outlet. And, and unfortunately, I was the main outlet for, for her to get that, you know, take it out on him. So when, she, when he did that, he would actually, you have to go. But here I am as a child, scared as heck, and don't want my mom to get into trouble. But I'm afraid of him. Because if I don't go to the police station and report it, then he's going to have to have to deal with him. So I remember being, I went to the police station. And I was outside just crying because I didn't want to go inside. And then, you know, one of the police officers came out and knew my family. And he saw, and he said, what's going on? And I told him, and he said, OK, let me take you home. And he took me back home, talked to her, and, uh, and that was it. He left, right? And, and, there's, and those are circumstances, by the way, that happens every single day today, yes. still. 
right? Yes. Some kid go to school, complain that they've been abused, and the parents say some you know, fancy words to the teachers and know this is what happened or that didn't, uh, and they send them back into that environment. Yeah. And especially with COVID, you know, my relief was going to school from the abuse. My relief was going to my friend's house from the abuse. I couldn't imagine being in that house for 24 hours with my mother. I couldn't imagine it. I would have been, I probably would have committed suicide. Yeah. Because there was no outlet. So think about what happened in COVID when these kids, or even an adult woman, is being abused by a spouse or a parent, and they're locked up for 24 hours with that abuser. And they have to deal with it because nobody's coming out to look after or help them, and there's no break. So people ask you know, about the book and why were you so personal about it. I'm personal because there's people living that dream, that nightmare rather, today. Yes, yes, and when we say that Wes gets personal, he gets personal. And I gotta tell you, Wes, this one scene, I feel like it, it shook me to the core. This is what he says about his mother. She also took pains to shame me in front of other people. Many mornings before school, she would get after me, telling me I was dirty. Her anger would build in volume and intensity until she was yelling about how I was embarrassing her by going out in public looking the way I did. She would then take me into the front yard and strip me naked as my classmates walked by on their way to school. She would go back into the house and come out again with a basin of cold water and a stiff bristle brush for scrubbing clothes and she would scrub me with it in full view of everyone passing on the street. The brush hurt, its stiff bristles and the frigid water combining to set my skin on fire. As she scrubbed, she would loudly berate me. You don't bathe, you're nasty. I'm gonna show you how to clean yourself. When she was finally done, I would have to dry myself, get dressed, and go to school where I would see all the kids who had walked past. Again, that is not discipline, it's torture. Yeah, so when somebody is supposed to love you unconditionally doesn't, what do you do? What do you do? Like, uh, you have to develop something deep within you that's gonna protect you because there's nobody else there to protect you. So, you know, remember we talk about poverty and being with my grandmother going to school and kids would laugh at me. I couldn't help it. I couldn't figure out where to get shoes from. I couldn't get shoes. So that's it, we're poor. We accepted it. So when she did that and I had to go to school, I also couldn't do anything about that behavior. So I had to accept the, the torture that she put me through and then after the ridicule that the kids now put me through when I go to school to deal with that. And so then here's my question to you, Wes, is, I mean, it's just what I so admire about you and writing this book. You are very raw and honest, clearly, from what I just read. What was it like for you to go back into your memory and have to retrieve these and then put it on paper? Yeah, so in, uh, in the beginning of the chapter, when I start to talk about uh, this part of the journey, I actually encourage people that if you've been through it, uh, you should skip this section. Uh, because I know what it's like to bring trauma to the forefront and, uh, and how it can affect your life in a, in a, in a, in a negative way. And um, somebody sent me a, a note over social media that they read the book, they saw the caution, they skip, skipped that section, but they felt compelled to have to go back to read it. And they said, you know, to me, my father used to beat me when I was seven, when I was younger, with a belt buckle. And, um, and, it was, uh, and it was every day my father would beat me. And when he died, I was seven years old when he died, and it was the happiest day of my life, the person said to me. And she said, I've never, ever said that to anyone. 
ever. You know, when you're, when you're really honest about what you've gone through, um, it sets other people free for being honest too and accept the trauma. My sister Hillary, my stepsister rather, she will not communicate to, with anyone in her family. She didn't go to her father's funeral. She, didn't, she doesn't talk to any of her siblings. She w doesn't talk to my mother. She doesn't talk to anyone but me because we had that. And I felt really bad when I sent the book to her because I debated whether or not I should yeah. because I knew that to this day she's affected by it. She can't live a normal life. She can't have a relationship. Um, she doesn't have kids because she go, I don't want to do that to children, so I don't want to risk it. So I don't want any kids. And she said to me, you know, when I talked to her, she said, you know, Wes, I am going to die in this apartment on my own, and nobody's going to know until they smell my body. Think about that trauma because of that experience. And so when you relive those trauma, like you, it's a tough place. But for me, uh, you know, I figured a way how to deal with it. You know, I... I, uh, I figured out a way to kind of uh, go, okay, I got 11 years with this amazing woman that I've learned so many great things from. And I watch her strength, her resilience, her industriousness. I saw it all. And that's what I'm going to focus on, that part of my life. That is huge. That is huge. So you made a decision. Yeah. You made a conscious decision of what you were going to focus on. Your teenage years would be tumultuous. Um, you leave your mom's home at 13. And it's interesting because- I, I didn't, oh, Anna, I wish I'd left. Oh, you can kind of- I didn't okay. have the strength to leave. <laughs> yeah. She kicked me out. She kicked you out. She kicked you out. And here's what's interesting, I didn't know this, but in Jamaica, culturally, to be on the street, it's, it's a very big stigma. So there he is, 13, kicked out, and you had to figure it out, but yet you felt free yeah. as well. So when we're in this, the town of Maypen, I was getting all the speed in, beat and beat and beat and beat, okay? And then she said, okay, they, f they bought a house. They struck enough money to buy a house in a place just outside of Maypen in a housing scheme they call them in Jamaica. And, and she kept on saying to me that I'm not taking you with us. We're gonna leave you behind and you can figure it out. And, uh, and at the time I would, I would have been about 12 and a half when she kept on saying that. And so finally, you know, I'm worried about what am I gonna do? How am I gonna survive? I was scared because I was 12 and a half years yes. old. And, um, and she threatened that she's not gonna take me and I you know, believed her. And so finally moving day came and she gave me the news that you're coming. I'm like, okay, what a relief. I'm gonna come. Think about that. She's been abusing me every day. I knew I'm gonna continue to get abused, but I was relieved that I'm not gonna be on the street. And so we went to this housing scheme and uh, living there, settled in, and then she, the, the beating started almost immediately. And at 13, she was in the backyard and she was like, you know, giving me some really good licks in, in the backyard. And, but every time when my mom would say something, raise her voice, I would start to cry. And uh, so she didn't even have to go the distance of administering uh, uh, discipline with her, with her fist or whatever she used, you name it, she used it. She didn't have to, but she did anyways. And so this time I wasn't crying at all. You know, there's a time when a boy becomes a man. There's that turn that happens, and it's just like instantaneous. And I became a man at 13. I literally did. I'm not gonna cry anymore. I can't do anything about it. You wanna beat me, beat me. And so I was watching, I was standing there looking at her while she was punching me in the face, you know, punching me in the stomach, you name it, and I was just watching. I was never a child who would retaliate and hit her, because I wasn't that person. And so I, I, and then in midair, she just stopped because she realized that it had no impact now. Our power is gone. And she stopped and she said, oh, you're a man now. And she went inside and she packed a bag, it was a straw bag. She packed it with whatever she could from me and she threw it outside. And she go, now you're a man, you can be on your own. 
And, uh, and I picked up that straw bag and I started to walk up the street. And that's how it was liberated because I spent so much time before that worried about being homeless. And now it happens. And I also realize that there's nothing I can do about it but just try to figure out how to not be homeless, not be on the street, even for a night. And, and you gotta also appreciate that I was in school at 13. So you know, the next day I couldn't like go, I'm going to school. I gotta figure out when I'm gonna sleep, where I'm gonna sleep tonight. And then I gotta figure out while I'm walking up that street and uh, okay, who am I gonna go to first? I couldn't go to my classmates because they were living with people who were poor and they're not gonna take me in. So okay, I gotta go to, I can't go to a couple because then the man has to go to his wife or his girlfriend and that may not happen. So who do I know that's single, that's an adult, that could make a decision like that? Let me start with that person. And we didn't have a cell phone that I can call them. I didn't have money to pay for a taxi. And where she lived was miles, like it's gotta be about 15 miles away from the nearest town. So I had to walk to that first house knock on that door, plea my case, but I have to figure out what my case is gonna be while I'm going there. How am I gonna plea the case? And the first guy was this Rastafarian guy, Oscar. Because Rastafarian guys are pretty easy going, they smoke their marijuana and that's all they do in life. And, and I'm like, you know, I'm pretty sure I can convince him. <laughs> if I can't convince him to take me in after one of those, you know, those joints, I'm not gonna convince anybody else, so. I convinced Oscar, and Oscar took me in, and uh, so that was that was that was start, yeah. And Oscar took you in, but it was temporary. So mm -hmm. for years, you were going almost like back couch surfing, yeah. back and forth, figuring it out, just making sure you have a roof over your head. And then your father calls for you. So now we're gonna fast forward. Um, to when your dad calls for you to come to Canada. But in this time, Wes is communicating with his father who's in Canada, and Wes's father sent him, what was those things, do you remember? Okay, <laughs> where are my people at that will reveal their ages? Wes, we're the same age. Do you remember those things that you had, you would look through and it would be like slides and you would click through it? Who okay. knows the name of that? Who, Who knows, knows the, the name? name? New Finder, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. So, so this, so Wes gets this. And this is like, this is Canada. <laughs> and so... Thinking through that thing. So what, like, what, were the, what were your images of Canada that were in that viewfinder? Polar bears, man. There's like, there's like polar bears. <laughs> this place is cold. <laughs> and this is, you know, it's just, it was just not like a place where I go, hey, you got to go there. And you got to appreciate the fact that back then, by the way, even before that, a lot of people were either immigrated to England or to the US. Yeah. Nobody was really thinking about Canada. You tell people you're coming to Canada, like, okay. <laughs> Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Because <laughs> that's the view we had, that it was just a cold place, yeah. And so you come to Canada. I gotta tell you, Wes, I screamed at the book. I read this book in one day, by the way. So he's here, and I get it, like I understand it, but then at 18, so he lives with his father, and at 18, he leaves. I yelled, no. I was like, Wes, no, you get back in there, and you stick it out. What are you doing? I was so mad at you for leaving, Wes. I mean, I get it. You weren't used to rules. You had been yeah. on your own from 13 to like pretty much 16, but I wanted you to stay. Yeah, uh, so... Um, <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of feelings about this. Yeah, so, so my, my buddy... Uh, Dwight Drummond was, uh, he called me up and he's like, Wes, I'm really mad at you. I'm late for work because I stayed up and I read your book. I was going to read one chapter, but I couldn't put it down until I get on the plane. You know, it's like leaving Saigon, like the last helicopter. It's like, I can't, I didn't think you were going to get on the plane. So I couldn't put it down until you get on the plane. I'm like, yes, he's now on the plane. So, you know, uh, oh, by the way, I, the reason why I was communicating with my dad, because my mom shut me off from everything and any opportunity that I could get, she would shut it off, right? So when my dad would write to her, my dad didn't write to me when I was younger, write to her, and, uh, but she was illiterate. And she would have me write, read the letters to her. And so that's when, and I'm like, and he has this, so I got his address, I got his phone number, and that's how I got it. So when she kicked me out, I had that with me. And then I called him. The resourcefulness. 
at every step. Like, are you hearing this? Are you hearing this? Sorry, go on. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I called. I would call my dad, and uh, and my dad wouldn't. My dad was. Oh, by the way, if you call my house, I never answer the phone. It's me. It's a Jamaican thing. <laughs> Jamaican men don't answer their phones. <laughs> okay. I don't answer the phone, so I never answer my phone. My dad didn't answer the phone. So my stepmom would answer the phone, and I've never met her before. And I'm a pretty personable guy. My dad has a, a, a daughter in Jamaica. Whenever she calls, and my dad's not there, she wouldn't talk to anybody else. She would just hang up. When I called, my stepmom would answer the phone, and I start to chat her up. And I say, you know, hi. And, and then I develop a relationship with her. And she really, really appreciated that relationship. And this is not in the book, by the way. Um, uh, but as a result of that relationship, I didn't even know later on how much it would have helped me. Because my sister, Navlet, came to Canada before me when she was about, uh, she's older, when she was about uh, 12 years old. And she was an only child of her mother. And uh, when her mother got you know, she was, she missed her. And she's like, I want her back to Jamaica. Yeah. And my dad go, no, I'm not gonna send her back. And she hired a lawyer in Canada and sued my dad. And my dad had to send her back to Jamaica. And my dad said, I'm never gonna bring another kid from Jamaica to Canada again. Well, you know, so that sealed my faith back in Jamaica. But then, I'm talking to my dad, my mom, my stepmom, and over time, my, my dad now goes, you know what, I'm gonna bring her here. You remember when everybody in Jamaica was saying, bring the girl with my mom? Yes. That's how they feel about girls, right? The boy can take care of himself, but the girl may not. So my dad go, okay, I'm changing my mind now. My, my, she's now 18 years old. I'm gonna bring her to Canada now. That, I don't have to get the mother's consent. My stepmother stepped in and stopped it and said, it's Wes's turn. Oh, no. Yeah. She said, it's Wes's turn. And she had a big fight with my dad on that issue about my turn. And she said, she had her turn. It's his turn. And if we want to do that after he gets his turn, then we'll do it. Right? But if I had behaved the way my sister had behaved, by just not talking to her and not building that relationship with her, she wouldn't have been an advocate for me. And it just goes to show some, you know, when you're not in a room, how many decisions are made on your behalf and you never know about it. Yes. And you never know how many opportunities were taken away from you because you're not in a room mm -hmm. or you have no advocates in a room. Mm -hmm. So I always say, and, and I got this far because of that, right? I always tried to figure out you know, where are the decision makers and who can I ally myself with to be my advocate because I cannot get in that room to advocate for myself? Honestly, this is what I so admire about you, Wes, because to this day, that's what you do. Every day. And you build relationships. I got to tell you, Wes, we say a lot of things about you when you're not in the room and it's all about how generous you are <laughs> and how amazing and, and wonderful you are, and, and now I feel like I can connect the dots. I can see your resourcefulness when it started. I could see how relationships, because these relationships were a roof over your head at times, right? Even in yep. Jamaica when you were going from couch to couch. So now you're in Canada, and you say here on page 180. But, but let me go yes. back, because yes, you, go you, back. You, you took exception to me leaving. And, uh, <laughs> and I just want just to clarify that, right? So when I... So my dad was a strict guy, right? They came to yeah. Canada and he was strict. And, um, and like I was calling my own shots in Jamaica. I, I was working, sending myself to school. I was doing it all. And then my dad now, okay, uh, I went to Pearson High School in, uh, in Malvern. And the school to walk from home to school, it's literally 15 minutes, 20 minutes tops if you're slow. And my dad, would call the house from work to make sure that I'm there 21 minutes later, okay? And, and that was it, I had to eat dinner at a certain time, I, had to, I couldn't hang out with my friends because 
all his friends that came from, that brought kids from Jamaica, they were getting in trouble, they were going to jail, they were selling drugs, they were doing all this stuff. He's like, you're not doing any of those things. So he, he had a tight control on me, right? But then he started, he was beating me as well. And I'm like, man, I left this building. <laughs> like, I left this, I can't be doing this. I'm not a kid anymore. Yes, I was 18, but I was not, not a kid anymore. And so I remember after uh, I, I got a, you know, my, my dad had a, you know, how many Jamaicans know the bus macaque? <laughs> and see that? Some of them are keeping quiet. <laughs> there's, a, there's a thing called it's a, uh, the bus macaque. It's made out of tire, a car tire, like a strip of it. It's about this long, and it's about this round, and it's stored upstairs in the drawer. And when your Jamaican parent's going to use it on you, they tell you to go get it. <laughs> go upstairs in the drawer and get the bus macaque. And you got to bring it and you hand it to them. And then you get your discipline with it, right? So I got the bus macaque and I started running around the house. And every, every time he, he hit, it was like missing. And there's like <laughs> black marks all over the house, the white walls, <laughs> okay? After he finished, I tried to get out the door. I couldn't get out the door. The door was locked. And I got finished off right there in front of the door. Okay. And then he said, okay, go get some soap water and wash all the walls. And after I was there washing the walls, that was it. That night, the next morning, I moved out. I didn't even tell him I was leaving. I just left. And, uh, and, and that's when I started that journey. But that journey was, keep in mind, you know, I was only here for two years. Brand new country. I was just finishing my last year of high school, and I go, I'm done. And, uh, and I started my journey in Canada uh, at 18. So at 18, and he's got to find a job, back again, finding a roof over your head. And you say, I had only been in Canada for five years, though. I hadn't gotten the message, and I didn't understand that there were limitations written on my skin. Yeah. Because you didn't see that when you were growing up. You know, even though we're in the barracks, um, we had black school teachers, black principals. Uh, if my brothers get into trouble and they go to this police station, the sergeant was black, the police officers were black, and uh, they go to court, the judge is black. Lawyers are black. The doctors we went to were black people. The businesses we shop at were black people. The only thing that prevented me from being one of those people that I admire so much was poverty. And poverty is very limiting, it's a condition. When I came to Canada September 27, 1985, that condition was cured. Because, and by the way, when I came here, I came on a Friday, went to school on a Monday, they put me back a grade and they put me in the ESL program. The English as a second language. There's a, you know, I, I, know, I don't wanna take away from all this, but there was a story behind that in the school, right? In the book. But they put me in the ESL program, and thanks to my dad, I was able to get out of the ESL program. Then they put me in basic. And you know, it was a whole streaming process that I went through. And, uh, but when I came here, if I'm smart enough, first of all, high school education was free. And it's a right that I had as a Canadian citizen, or a Canadian new, new immigrant. And if I'm smart enough, I can get to university through a scholarship. So, Poverty was no longer an issue for me. Education is now the secret to being successful. So when I was going through the process of climbing the ladder and doing all these different things, I just wasn't getting the message that somebody was saying no to me because I'm black. It just didn't, it wasn't it didn't. cluing in to me. Yeah. Well, it clued into my brothers and sisters that were born here. Because when they went to school, they didn't see black teachers, the principals, they don't see black police officers, judges and lawyers, business people. So immediately they realized that, okay, I'm not going to do this job because they don't hire black people in it. So I talked about in the book when I went to the law firm and I'm pushing the mail cart and I became a law clerk and I applied for a law clerk position and the woman said to me, you'll never be a law clerk here. I go, looked around and, oh, it's all women in this department, that's why. <laughs> I'm a guy. The lawyers are men. Back in the day, that's the case. And the law clerks are women. That's it. I better apply someplace else. And maybe 
there are a mixture of men and women law clerks in those law, other law firms. Had I got the message that was because I'm black, I wouldn't have applied to those other law firms. That's right. And it's interesting because you did apply, and there was somebody named Glenn O'Farrell. I got to tell you, when I read about Glenn, I just felt so much fondness towards him. So I got in touch with Glenn. <laughs> I spoke to him on Monday. <laughs> And I wanted him to share a little bit about you. So first of all, in the, in the book, Wes describes how he's going for this interview with Glenn. And then Glenn, Glenn's assistant, I guess, calls mm -hmm. up and says to Wes, Glenn would like to take you out for a drink and talk with you further. Well, Wes doesn't know what that really means. I'm a Malford guy. Yeah, he, he has no idea. <laughs> so he goes and he meets Glenn for a drink. And you know how when you're like going for an interview or something and someone asks you questions, you're very um, thoughtful in your response. So, so for example, Wes might have said, I grew up in, with a big family in a close-knit community. Might be some ways to reframe. He didn't do any reframing. <laughs> Glenn said, tell me about yourself. And he said it all. He told him everything. Like I'm doing now. <laughs> like he's doing now. And so I said to Glenn, I said, Glenn, when you read the book, I said, Glenn, like, do you know the impact that you had with Wes? Like, you changed the trajectory of his life. Like, you really made a difference. And he said, I didn't know. And this is what he said about you. He said that, what made, that you made an impact on him. He said, for him, he was doing what he felt was right. He said, you had an infectious energy, a disposition full of sunshine, a radiance within you that he imagines comes from your grandmother. He says he saw a person who on paper didn't have all the experience, but he knew in his heart that he was to hire you. He said, it worked out so well because you wanted to do well. He says you were diligent, industrious, and he was happy for you when you moved on, which I thought that's a great leader. He also mentions Christine, your wife, and he says she was such a positive force and is a positive force in your life. And he says he loves you and he thinks of you like a little brother. You know, when I, I recently had the uh, Canadian Chamber of Commerce Business Leader of the Year uh, a few weeks ago. I invited a bunch of folks to sit with me at the head table. Glenn was one of them. Aww. And uh, when I went up and accepted my award and I gave my speech and I thanked him and others who've helped me along the way, then I went down and Glenn came over and he hugged me. And he started crying. Yeah. And he said to me, Wes, I didn't do, do any of these things you give me credit for. All I did was I gave you a job. That's it. And I said, but you don't understand. You gave me a job when others wouldn't. Yeah. And that's the difference. And, uh, and I remember when I had left that job, I worked with them for five years. And I probably should, you know, let me go back a little bit before, because a year into the job, Glenn was a tough boss. And he just gave me the gears because I screwed up on something. And I said, I, I called my wife up and I said, Christine, I'm quitting. And she said, nope, let's talk about it first. Come home and talk about it. And we talked about it and then he became the best boss ever. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, if you have no one to talk you off a ledge, chances are you're gonna jump, yeah. right? And, uh, and Christine talked me off a lot of ledges over the years. And so when Glenn hugged and said, you know, Wes, you did it. And I told him what I felt. And I remember when I was leaving the job, I wrote him a card. And I said in the card, Glenn, I will never for the rest of my life forget, forget the opportunity that you've given me. And for the rest of my life, no matter how much I've achieved, I'm always going to hand the credit back to you. Now, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know how life was going to be. But I knew that that door that he cracked open for me, wherever it leads, it's because of him. And I wanted him to know it then, and I still let people know it today. Wow, 
you just never know. And who, and you know, when we read and we hear people's stories, I always invite you to listen for yourself. Who can you be the person to open the door for as you hear Wes's story? Because it's impactful if you can take from it and start to think about how you can do things differently. And speaking of Christine, you know, one of the things that I think about Wes is, Christine, your five children. But how did you know how to be a partner and a father? Could I say something that's not in the book, by the way? And this oh, please, is, this dude, is we love an exclusive. I'm gonna tell you about, you know, <laughs> Christine and the kind of person that she is. Okay. First of all, I asked her out uh, three times before she said yes. And, um, and she was 19 years old when we got married. That was 21 turning 22. And um, we got married, and I, I always had the ambition to bring all my siblings from the barracks to Canada. From the moment I got here, that was my goal, to bring my grandmother and all my siblings from the barrack. And, um, but the only way to do that, because I have 14 brothers and sisters, but not a full, none of them are full brothers and sisters. I'm one of one. That's why I'm so unique. <laughs> right. And uh, so I had to, to show the connection that I have with these siblings, because we all have a different last name. It has to go through my mother. So the way the immigration law worked at the time was I had to apply for my mother first, and then I had to put all my siblings on the application form as well. So she has to come in order for that, me to help them. And, uh, and I remember we went through the process, and I called my mother, and I said to her, I just got married. I want you to delay the process until next year for everybody to, to come up. And uh, I was sitting down with my lovely wife uh, that we just got married June 6, 1992, we got married. And literally a month later, I'm sitting at home, and I got a phone call. And the phone call was from my mother. And she said, uh, we're at the airport. At and, I, Pearson? and I said, what airport? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she said, the, the airport in Canada, we're here. I'm like, OK, who's here? And they said, us. So I went to the airport. My mother was there. My older sister, Barbara, was there, the one who came in with, the, with my grandmother to get us. My uh, younger sister, um, Natalie, my brother, Ian, and my brother, Michael. And I went to get them and brought them there and told my wife, okay, this is my mom. <laughs> it's my two sisters. These are my two brothers, and they're going to be living with us. We've been married for a, uh, a month, and she was 19. <laughs> and that relationship in that house with seven of us in a two-bedroom place is a book. <laughs> that, if you read the story and you see how my mother treated me now, having that and the way she's treating the other siblings of mine in that house and them retaliating with that treatment. It was a book, and my poor wife, there's times when she could not go in the house. Mm -hmm. And she would wait outside. And by the way, I was in the mail room, yeah. pushing a mail cart. I didn't have money. And, uh, and I remember when they came, and I had to enroll my two, because my sister would, um, was 16, 15. My brother was 16. My brother Ian at the time was 19. And um, so I had to enroll the younger kids in high school. And I had to buy them winter coats. And I had to go to Costco to shop for food for all these people on the money I didn't have. So Christine and I kind of put it all together, did what we needed to do. And, uh, and so, yeah, for, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that she's stuck around for 30 years, <laughs> given that start. <laughs> that is incredible. That is yeah. so incredible. And I know that, um, that, you know, we're coming to time here 
Could I say one thing yeah, though, you may. Hannah? Because yes. I want to talk about the next picture, uh, Denise. That picture. So on this, and why I keep that first picture that you saw there on, on my desk. On this trip, this was me and my grandmother inside the house. And on this trip is when I made the commitment to her that I'm going to get her out of that tin shack. And on that very trip, my grandmother packed her suitcase, waited for that, to wait for that phone call. On that trip, that commitment, over my right shoulder is that suitcase that she packed. On that trip, my grandmother, years later, fell off this bed. She hit her head and she died there. She had never got out of the tin shack. And when I went back to bury her, I had to unpack that suitcase with her belongings to come to Canada. And at the time, you got to appreciate the fact that she didn't get the opportunity. My mom got the opportunity that she deserved. My mom is here till this day in Canada. She deserved that. She never got it. And, uh, and, and, but what I was waiting for after all those siblings came, and I have to look after them and so on, I go, I got to now wait for the right circumstances to bring my grandmother over now. And I go, I got to get a better job. I got to do all these different things. And uh, when I finally got that job on Bay Street, I became a vice president on Bay Street. And I'm like, I'm going to get mom over here now. Three weeks later is when she died. And so the reminder that I have is never wait for the perfect opportunity to do the right thing. Because that's what we generally do as people, right? We got to wait for the moment to be right. All my grandmother wanted was to live in Canada with her grandson. The other thing that I take from this as well, and that's why you should always push. Remember I told you that for generations we work on the plantation. Do we have the picture of the plantation? Uh, uh, just what a plantation looked like. That's a plantation. Think about these people on this plantation. Think about you being there and your ch children and their children. And you know that this is what they're going to do for generations. But then one of them didn't. And within 40 years, less than 40 years, I went from working with my grandmother here to where I'm at today, standing. OK? Nothing is impossible. Nelson Mandela says, it always seems impossible until it's done. And we don't really know how truthful, truthful that statement really is. Because we always look at the obstacles and go, it's never going to happen. As a result, I wanted, could you imagine if my grandmother was in the audience sitting here today, remembering the day when she went to get the trolley to pull me out of that tin shack that my, my mother left me in? And then she's like, it's possible. And so, you know, my, my blackness, my whatever, those were not things that I used for people to say, no, you can't do this or you can't do that. Look at the journey that I took. And I'm going to let somebody tell me that, well, Wes, you can't do that because uh, you, know, you kind of this color. you black. And I'm going to stop. You know, so whatever it is, your gender, your sexual orientation, your disability, whatever it is, and people say, you cannot do these things because of. You tell them that I'm going to do these things in spite of. And that's what I was able to do. You know, yeah. so there's this chapter in the book that put Kingsdale on the map. Can I tell you, it was like a Mission Impossible. I was like, that, that, the fax machine, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Getting that in there. Anyways, you guys are just going to have to read the book to figure it out. It is, this needs to be a movie. I know there's been a documentary on your yeah. life, but this needs to be a movie. Okay, I'm yeah. passionate, I know. I've got more to say here. What, like, sorry. Yes. Yeah, no. like, we kept on going. I'm sorry for you guys I have know, some place to go. Uh, but, uh, so, yes, I started this business, and it became the number one company in Canada for the last 20 years. Uh, yes. And, uh, you know, so, so our firm is like the go-to firm for anyone dealing with hostile takeover and shareholder activism and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and I talked about the fact that, you know, in a book, I, I got this far because I took advantage of every single opportunity presented to me. 
every single one of them. And so when I started, when I left uh, my dad's place, and I didn't really want to know what I wanted to do. I'm in high school, right? I'm like, what do I do after high school? I better get a job. I'm like, okay, I called my buddy Steve, hey, I need a job. And his mom worked at the chicken factory. It's like, okay, Wes, you're gonna work as a chicken factory. Yeah, okay, you want that? Like, done, I'll take the chicken factory job. I went to the chicken factory. And, uh, and I'm like, uh, the guy gave me a hairnet and he's like, this is the, you need a hairnet, white hairnet and, and you need a white uh, gown. And you see those, that assembly line over there, yep, yep. See those chickens coming down with their ass down like that? Yeah, you gotta take this vacuum, right? And you're gonna shove it up their asses and it's gonna go <laughs> And you're gonna do that for nine hours a day. Two 15 minute breaks, one in the morning, one in the evening and a 30 minute lunch break and that's what you're gonna do for the rest of your life. And I go, man, start to do that. <laughs> and then I'm the only teenager on the assembly line the only teenager, everybody is like 65, speaking no English, and I'm listening, and I go look at my watch, I'm like, 30 minutes later, I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> so I am a quitter, by the way. I can't, I can't do this. I'm like, went to my supervisor, I said, listen, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do that, I'm getting wheezy, and you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna faint, <laughs> just from the sound, okay? <laughs> And, uh, and the guy's like, okay, I think we have an, a, a, you know, put you to the HR department. HR says, I got the perfect job for you, don't worry. Match your skills perfectly. Went upstairs, said, okay, supervisor, there's that truck. Yeah, they have crates, yeah. See those crates, they have chickens in them, live chickens. You're gonna get those live chickens out of the crate. You're gonna put them down this assembly line and their heads are gonna get chopped off down there. Okay, and uh, that's it. So I'm now taking the chickens. No, they knew what was going on, right? The chickens knew that this is not good. <laughs> this guy's the Grim Reaper. And they start to scratch me and everything, and it take me a while. But then the guys with the vacuum are waiting for me downstairs. So I got to work fast. Half an hour later, I'm like, <laughs> sorry, I can't do this. Supervisor's like, okay, let me bring it to the HR department. HR says, um, there's no other jobs here that fit your skills. <laughs> and I now gotta wait for Steve's mom, who gave me the gears all the way home. Cause I had to wait in the cafeteria for her because she was my ride home. I lasted one hour. And people go, I wouldn't take that job. But that could have been my thing. I could have worked from there to become the plant manager, to become the CEO, right? And it's the same thing when I got the mailroom gig. People would go, I would never take a mailroom job. But look at where it led me, to where I'm at today. You never know what your thing is until you try it. And so those opportunities that people were presenting to me, I could have said no to a lot of them. That wouldn't have led me here today. And so open doors, close them. Don't leave them unopened. And uh, so that's what I was able to do for, the, for my, my whole time. Now, starting a business, Kingsdale, I've never done that before. Hey, by the way, when I left the mailroom to go to Glen, I've never, like, you read the book and it's like, I was learning stuff while I was pushing my mail cart. And I was regurgitating the stuff that these students were telling me in the interview. And the guy was impressed. <laughs> Gave me the job, now I gotta figure it out. <laughs> I gotta turn all those nice things that I'm saying, M&A, I'm like, what's an M&A? I gotta figure that out now, okay? And so I took the job, did it. Then took the another job after that, reporting to 11 people reporting to me in the transfer agency business, didn't even know what they did. And then did that. Then went to Georgeson, didn't know what they did. The guy offered me a job as a, uh, as a director. I said, I don't wanna be a director, I wanna be a vice president. I was sitting in my, you know, I was in the bedroom. We had no furniture in the house. My wife was on the bed on a box spring. The man called me, offered me a job, almost double the salary I was getting. But I said, I'm not gonna take it because of the, the title. To me, the title meant a lot because I can leverage that title in the future. Nobody knows that I was not getting paid enough to be a vice president, but that title meant a lot. And I wanted it, and he said no. But when you call someone's bluff, you have to be prepared to live with the consequences. The man said, I can't give you that job. I said, when you can give it to me, call me. 
Hang up the phone, my wife was freaking out. She's like, we don't even have furniture. <laughs> and you're turning the job down? A week later, the man called me and said, I have the authority to give you the job. He gave it to me, vice president, okay? I know a vice president, and I don't even know what they did. <laughs> but I gotta figure it out. And when I left that to start Kingsdale, never started a business before, but I gotta figure it out. And so, just take advantage of every opportunity that's presented to you because you never know where they're gonna lead. You know, when my grandmother was, you know, looking after us, she had to bake puddings to supplement her plantation income. She made the best pudding in Golden Grove. People from miles would come to the market early just to buy her puddings. But the way that we would make puddings, we, had, we didn't have electricity in the, uh, in the tin shack. We didn't have uh, running water in the tin shack. We had to do, the kitchen was a car rim that you put wood on and you cook your food or you do your baking on it. So that's what she did. So she could only bake like two or three pa you know, pans of pudding. And she did that, and then she'd bring it to the market, and within an hour, it sold out. Now, what would you do if your thing sold out within an hour? Would you bake more? Yes. Or would you charge more? Charge. My grandmother charged more. <laughs> okay? That's my first opening to entrepreneurialism. She's like, I'm not going to bake more. I'm just going to charge more. And of course, these people are like, Julie, how come you charge me so much for the pudding? Last year, you charged me this. And, and, and my grandmother was like, OK, you see the people behind you? They're going to pay it. So could you move? And then they take the money out and they pay it. So when I started Kingsdale, that model came back to me. And I went, I want to build a boutique firm. I'm going to charge a lot of money for what I do, a lot. And, uh, and literally, my competitor at Georgeson, and they were big. That was like a one-man shop. And they were big, and I decided I'm going to bid against them in a file. Because I built my firm differently, and I sold. I was a good sales guy, but I can execute. But I had no clients to execute. So they were a New York firm, very large, making $300 million in revenue a year, US. And I was just one man shop competing against them. And they would put a proposal out for 100 grand. And I would put the exact same proposal out for 500,000. And people thought, you probably think I'm crazy. But if you receive a proposal, if you have a bet the farm situation, somebody's coming after your company to replace you as a CEO, okay? and you have two proposals in front of you to help you. One says 100 and one says 500. Aren't you compelled to at least talk to the 500,000 guy to go, why are you so damn expensive? That's the opening I need because like I said, I was their top sales guy. And when they call me, there's no way they're gonna pay $100,000 for that. And I got my 500. And so until this day, we're five times higher than our closest competitor and there are five companies doing what we do in this country, and we're number one. Yeah. Value. <laughs> Learn from a plantation worker yes. as to how to value yourself yes. and how to demand that value from people. And when people aren't prepared to pay that value, you tell them to move on because others will. Wow. Right? So she was not educated, but she had street smarts. And I got this far because I have a lot of street smarts. And so we all have it in us, but sometimes we don't pull up on it, right? We don't get deep into it and pull it. So my message to you all, take advantage of every opportunity. We talk about the glass ceiling, right? What happens with the glass ceiling? Why do we still have a glass ceiling? Because every time it's shattered, some dude goes behind you and fix it. We need to find those dudes were fixing the glass ceiling, get rid of them. <laughs> and that's what our society is all about. It's to find those obstacles to, 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 to success and to moving forward and removing those obstacles. And those obstacles are times or people. And we have to be strong enough to stand up and go, you need to be out of here. Or you need to change. Yes. And that's one of the reasons why I started Black North, to say, we need to change. 
and we need to get as many people as possible to stand up and say, this is not acceptable, this ceiling must be removed, and we're working collectively to remove it. And I love with Black North how you are um, using, you're incorporating homes, owning home ownership as part of the initiative. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, so my, when I came to Scarborough, when I came here, my dad was a factual worker, my, mom, my stepmom was a factual worker, and they brought us to a place in Malvern that they owned, their own home. And they were able to leverage that home to send every single one of their kids that stayed at home through university because they had a home. And uh, so I know that the way out of poverty, and if you look at all the rich people in this country, where they make the money, real estate. They knew the value of real estate. And so they started to invest in early. And as a result of that, they're able to leverage the rise in the value of the asset that they own to now do other things, like starting a business, send your kids to a university, and so on. If you're gonna rent all the time, you have nothing to leverage. You have nothing to leverage. So I saw that when my dad, you know, I'm like, I wanna be like this guy when I grew up, right? Because he had a home, kids were going to school, um, he, you know, great job, but he was a factory worker. I just saw success, and it's because of that home that he had, that they still have to this day, by the way, uh, that created that opportunity for his kids. And so I know, for example, most black women in this country are single mothers, just like my grandmother was. And they have to work very hard, and in a lot of cases, they're living in community housing. And by the way, not because you're living in community, community housing doesn't mean that you're not paying market rent. 70% mm -hmm. of the people in community housing are actually paying market rent. They're paying what they would pay anywhere else. But the comfort zone that they have is that. And it almost suggests that they're being done a favor by living in community housing when they can actually do better. And so what we're encouraging um, uh, builders and governments to do is that, okay, let's change the conversation by creating pride in ownership. And that pride is gonna create opportunities where these people in these neighborhoods are gonna treat their homes a certain way. Nobody's gonna know who is who. And then the value of their home, they now can leverage that value to do other things, to get themselves out of poverty. And so that's what we're doing with, we're doing some transformative things, you know, with the Black North Initiative. But again, it goes way back to being in poverty, clawing my way out, and then looking back and say, no, we gotta do something about this. One of my friends, uh, Justice Donald McLeod, he's from community housing, and he said to me, Wes, when we're from poverty, we become first responders. Our job is to go back into poverty and pull as many people out as we possibly can. And a lot of people, when they get to the point where they're wearing fancy shoes and fancy suits and driving nice cars and living in great neighborhoods, they forget very quickly where they came from. And they'll never tell their story and everybody just see the finished product, yes. and that's all they want them to see. Yes. And I would say that those people are not being true to themselves. Yes. They're not being true to others, and they're actually doing a disservice to the opportunities that we have in this great country. So I posted something yesterday on my citizenship card about how grateful I was in 1980, and then I got it, because after a few years, you can apply for being a citizen, and I, as soon as I was eligible, I applied. On the back of it, it says, you know, I am a, a, a allowed all the, all, the response, all the privileges of being a Canadian on the back of the card. But I also have all the duties that comes with being a Canadian. If you are successful, you have a duty to pay it forward. A duty. It's not there to hoard it and say, okay, I'm going to see how much I can die with. How much can you change lives while you're doing it? And then see the impact that it has because now that you're a citizen, you have a duty to change things for others. And so when we think about refugees coming to this country, we have a duty to help them. We have a duty to welcome them. The average refugee spends 17 years in a refugee camp. People don't know that, think about it. You're like in prison, but you're not, because you can't leave. And then when a country like Canada goes, okay, we'll take 10 of them. We go, no, no, we don't want 10. We don't want any. But if we understand what those people go through and the contribution that they can bring to our society, we're gonna open our arms and welcome as many of them as possible. And so my story encourages others 
to open their arms and to welcome other people like me because you never know what they can do for this country. Wes, I want to I want to thank you for sharing your story. I know that when you realized that your grandmother, mama had her bag packed, it undid you that you did not bring her here. It took you a long time to process that. But what I love is in this book, we all know her. And they're going to buy the books for people, and other people are going to know her and know her strength. And you are going to change so many lives that you don't even know because you had the courage to not only share your story, but publish it. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. That was Wes Hall. You can buy his book. We have the link in the description and also find out more about Black North. And remember what to do. Rate, review, download, subscribe, do all the things. And we'll see you here next time.